All right. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Christiana Lilly. Um, you've probably seen me on Slack and you've heard from me more than once on email. You're going to hear from me more. Sorry about that. Um, but um, before we start, I also just wanted to say that not only am I going to be talking about polling today, but just going forward with the fellowship, if you have any questions, if you're having issues with your newsroom, or if you have a quote unquote dumb question that you don't want to ask you know, your superiors or whatever, you can always come to me. I am there for you as the fellow liaison. Our colleague James is going to be working with newsrooms. Obviously, you can talk to both of us, but my entire job is to help you all out. So give me something to do over the next few weeks. So um, how is everything going so far? I know it's the second day of training. I'm not sure how many trainings y'all have had so far. Everybody's on mute, that's okay. All right, so um, I saw some people were talking about imposter syndrome and I have a little bit of imposter syndrome right now because somebody I guess thought that I was qualified to teach you guys about polling. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and then let's. All right, and then as we're going along, feel free to unmute yourself and stop me and ask a question. Um, it's just like a nine of us, I think. So it's not like a giant group. So that's okay. And I'm not going to be able to see the chat. So let's not use that. All right. So the session was everything you need to know about polling, but I want to backtrack a little bit and say it's almost everything you need to know about polling. Um, really quick, has anybody used polling in their reporting or, you know, at their internships or jobs or anything like that? No? All right. So you've probably heard about it in past elections or just e even, you know, newscasters talking about, you know, according to the latest polling, you know, people are feeling X, Y, Z, and they're doing percentages and everything like that. And they get it either from their own polling. Some news organizations are able to afford and have the manpower to do their own polling. And other places, mostly they are going to different pollsters. There's different companies and agencies and think tanks that conduct their polling. And then news agencies get press releases from them, or they just subscribe to their news and they will share that. So um, before we begin, my name is Christiana. Again, I'm the fellowship coordinator at Harkins Ex Election SOS program. I'm a freelance journalist in South Florida, and I'm also the past president of SPJ Florida. So I'm really involved with journalism, kind of nerding out about that. It seems like a lot of you guys are as well. So I think we're all going to get along just fine. All right. And then the weeks leading up to election day, as if as you can already tell are crazy and it's this way no matter what election it is. So candidates are participating in debates, they're reacting to breaking news, politicians and groups are gonna share their support for candidates, they put out press releases, or now it seems like everybody just tweets out their disapproval or approval of different things. And as these news events happen, people change their opinion on the candidates and they change their opinion on issues. And that's where news agencies are really interested to find out where people stand on things. And so that's why they generate a lot of stories from polls from agencies around the country. And like I said before, this is research centers, think tanks, and a lot of universities have also been doing polling for a very long time. So I thought this photo before we move on was very interesting. It's actually a colorized photo from 1963. It's a march. And as you can see, it looks like a lot of the same you know, voting issues that we are dealing with today. So when I was looking for a photo to put up, I actually thought it was from today and everybody was just really cool and vintage looking. Then I realized it's from 1963. So I just thought that was interesting. All right, so who is conducting these polls? Who sits around all day and figures out how people feel about things? Some of the major polling agencies, and this is not um, a comprehensive list of all of them. Um, do any of these look familiar to you all? Have you seen like these names flown around or people mentioning these? I see some head shakes. If not, that's fine. That's why you're here today. So there's 538. Quinnipiac University has a polling institute, Rasmussen, the Pew Research Center, Gallup, Monmouth University, Marquette Law, Pol Public Policy, Polling. I'd have a million more slides if we had to list all of them, but these are the ones that I see the most and see a lot of um, news outlets referring to. Now, each of these, some people will have different opinions on them, because even though we're trying to do something as seemingly scientific as polling and seeing how people feel about things, 
there's a margin of error. There's always going to be bias. So if you're looking at different polling agencies, you can look up on Wikipedia or other, you know, reporting on them where they'll say this one tends to favor Democrats, this one tends to favor Republicans, or this one guessed the last election correctly, this one was way off on the election. And we'll go into that. So when you're looking at where you're getting your poll, you want to find out what their reputation is, how long they've been around, and if they are a agency that you want to share with your readership. Other agencies, so now for me personally, I do a lot of reporting here locally for South Florida Gay News. And some two really great agencies that I get a lot of information from is the Williams Institute and the Gill Foundation. They specifically focus on LGBT issues. So that was very interesting. For example, when the Defense Against Marriage Act was, was overthrown, they were gauging people's thoughts on pro against same-sex marriage, pro against gay adoption, and other issues that are impacting the LGBT community. So it's always good, especially if it's a community that is really vibrant in your readership and in your um, network. There's some of these smaller groups that focus on these smaller communities. And there's also groups that focus on like, you know, what black voters are thinking, Hispanic voters, and might, while they might not do polling, they might do studies and surveys and also, you know, what they're, what, what they're hearing from the community. Also, the American Association for Public Opinion Research, this is sort of like the big daddy of all the organizations. They, all these different polling agencies will be members of this group. And so they hold ethical standards and vet these different polling agencies. So what should I look at when I'm reading a poll? Does anybody want to, you know, that has worked with polls want to talk about, you know, what are some things that you look at when you receive a poll or you get a press release, somebody that's worked with polls before? Um, I think one of the things that typically a reporter, uh, when they're covering uh, or doing a story on the recent polls um, is looking at the margin of error. Mm hmm. Excellent. And so now if, if, was, if any of you were as terrible as stats as I was, don't worry. We'll talk about it a little bit more. It's a lot of numbers and everything. And I know a lot of you are data journalists. So you're not as turned off by numbers. But for those of us that still get anxiety attacks about it, it's, it's fine. We're going to get through this together. All right. So question, when was the poll conducted? So as we're talking, I see some of you taking notes, that's totally cool, but I'm also, I can also share with you this PowerPoint, so you don't have to do that, but if that's how you learn best, that's totally cool, but I don't want you to feel rushed. So when was the poll conducted? If 2020 has shown us anything, things change constantly from week to week to week. And so people are constantly changing their minds and especially swing voters. They might be swayed by different developments. Somebody may have had a different opinion of Donald Trump before he contracted coronavirus as opposed to after. They might be like, you know, I've heard people saying it's a hoax. So they might have a more negative feeling than they did before. Some people might have what they're calling sympathy votes where they feel bad for him for that and they'll change their mind on that. Next week, who knows what's going to happen. So if a poll was conducted last year asking people their thoughts on, you know, how do you feel favorably towards Joe Biden or favorably towards Donald Trump, that really is completely out of date now. Some other issues that maybe are a little bit more, they're less fluid, you maybe can refer to that, but it's also important to let your readers know when the poll was done. And a lot of these polling agencies will put out polls every week. So they'll say, this, you know, covers August 28th to September 28th. So for the last month or was done in the last week. So I think that's something really important to let your readers know. And I also like to actually link out to the poll in my reporting so that people that want to see more of that information that maybe you don't have the, the space to share with them, they can click on it and they can read it themselves. I feel that's also a really great way to be transparent with your audience. I love linking out to things because I know personally as a journalist and as a consumer of news, when I'm reading the news and I see them referring to a lawsuit or if they're referring to a law that was just passed, I like to read it to make sure that the reporting was done factually. And it's really easy for me if I can just click on it rather than Googling it myself. So another piece of information that we want to look at, how many people were polled? And I'm going to show you some examples of polls, so we'll go into all these details there. But reputable polling agencies are going to give you all of these metrics. When was the poll conducted and how many people were polled? 
And you'll see that the amount will vary. Sometimes they talk to a thousand people, sometimes they talk to 10,000 people. And when you look at that, you have to think, is this a good enough number of people to correlate their views to the entire country or to the state or to the political party? And sometimes it's hard to tell because, you know, a thousand might not seem like a lot, but to these pollsters, they may have also not only talked to a thousand people, but talked to a thousand people in a diverse area of people with different political leanings, have different issues going on in their communities. But it's also really important to make sure it's obviously like a scientific study. They may have tested something on 10 people and for them that's adequate in a poll of how they feel about things and extrapolating it to the nation. 10 people's not gonna cut it. So look at how many people were polled. And then like we were talking before, who conducted the poll? What agency carried out this poll? And are they a reliable, reputable source? How long have they been doing this for? You know, is this some guy in their basement calling people? Or is this an actual university funded study? Or is this an agency that I mentioned before that this is all they do and they're good at it and they have people that are researchers that are going into it and actually looking into it and analyzing the data that they get back. So also, if you're not familiar with an agency, you can always do a search and see what their history is, what reporting has been done on them, and see if other news agencies that you trust have cited them. You can also ask in your newsroom, your newsroom leader, if you're unsure about a polling source, if this is a polling source that they trust and get their opinion on that. And then this is an interesting one how was the poll conducted? And we'll go into how polls are conducted, but find out were they only done in certain states? If it's a poll of the United States, but they only talk to people in Florida and Texas, how, how good of that is that? And then I know for me in Florida, Anthony can attest to this, if you're polling the entire state of Florida, but you look and they only polled people in North Florida, North Florida tends to lean very Republican as opposed to South Florida tends to lean very Democrat. So if you talk to only one region over the other, it's not gonna be representative of the entire state. So also think about your own state and be familiar with where your Democratic hubs lie, where your Republican hubs lie, or if you're in a red state or a blue state, maybe the entire state pretty much tends to feel one way or the other towards a political party. So look at those things about how the poll was conducted. And then, like I said, we're gonna talk about methods because the method in which they gather the information is really important. Also check the word choice. So when you're reporting, you think about your word choice and being um, non-biased. This also was really important in polling. So you think about what somebody might think about a question being asked about Obamacare versus a question about the Affordable Care Act. They're the exact same thing, but we might have different opinions about that. Somebody might not like Obama and not be as familiar with the Affordable Care Act. And if you ask them, do you feel favorably or non-favorably towards Obamacare? If they're not familiar with it, but they know they don't like Obama, that can sway what their opinions are on that. So when you're looking at a poll, they also usually release the actual questionnaire so you can see what questions were asked of them. You can also find out, were the questions really confusing? Did they have 17 double negatives and even I reading it can't make sense of what the question is and how many people maybe misunderstood the question or opted not to answer it because they didn't understand it. All right, and then like Maya Sell mentioned, the margin of error. Each poll is gonna share their margin of error because as scientific as we try to make something, nothing can be 100% unbiased and perfect. So for example, if they say we had a 3% margin of error, if the information says 48% of Democrats approve of Joe Biden, that means that 48% has a 3% margin of error so it could be as much as 51% or as little as 45% because of that 3% margin of error. So now if you have a study and their margin of error is like 98%, <laughs> that's not gonna be reliable because then basically you have no concrete information that they've released. They must have messed up somewhere. So you really wanna make sure the margin of error is as low as possible. If you see one that's zero though, I've never seen one that's zero, but if somebody's claiming that they have a 0% margin of error, they're lying and they think way too highly of themselves. 
question anomalies. So if you're looking at the results and it doesn't sound right to you, like if it says 98% of Democrats are in favor of Donald Trump, it's like, I just know personally that's not right. Number one, wrong party. Number two, how did they get to that? So you can also compare other polls from other organizations that maybe have asked that same question and see what numbers they came up with. And then also look at those questions, look at those other things that we've been discussing. How did they maybe get that information? Were they asking a very, you know, were they asking a swing state? Were they talking to people that live in an area that just flipped from Republican to Democratic or Democratic to Republican? Have these people not updated their voter registration? So think of the anomaly not as a news story, but as a sign that something wasn't done right in that analysis. You want to see what the average is, because an anomaly, while it might make a great news story, oh my god, 98% of Democrats are in favor of Donald Trump, you're going to look like an ass when it finds out, oh, we flipped the numbers by accident. So you really need to question your sources, and if something doesn't look right, you can even reach out to the public relations person and ask them, like, how did this come about? This doesn't look right. None of the other polls have this information. So question anomalies instead of seeing it as a news story opportunity, unless you want to write about this poll is so wrong, it was, you know, 98%. All right, do we have any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Is there anything that's coming up that maybe you guys want to talk about? I know this is really riveting stuff, guys. All right, so how are polls conducted? How the heck do they come up with these numbers? So has anybody ever been involved in a poll? I actually got a call on my cell phone last week from a university in Southern California and they asked me to be in a poll and I was like, perfect, because I'm doing a session on polling. So they called my cell phone and it didn't come up as spam. And because I get calls from all over, I'm not really sure if it's legit or if it's somebody through Election SOS and everything. So I answered and they told me, you know, I'm calling from the University of Southern California. We're conducting a poll. Do you have time? And I was like, well, I don't want to be that person that hangs up on them. So I said, fine. And it took me like five minutes. They were asking me questions about my thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement, whether I lean liberal or conservative, if I'm planning on voting early or if I'm planning on voting in person. Um, they did not ask for my name. They did not ask for where I live or any identifying information like that. And so probably where they got it was from the voter rolls and Florida being a swing state and a state that always causes trouble, they probably wanted to find out more from people that are registered to vote in Florida, and that's probably how I got on their radar. So that's a live or traditional polling method. These interviewers, they can be volunteers or they could be people that are being paid and they can go through voter poll registration. You can look up your voter registration. It'll have your phone number, your address, the party you're registered with, how many each times that you've voted. It won't say who you voted for, but it'll say like, for example, it'll say I voted in the Florida primaries in August. It'll say that I registered to vote in October 2004. Oh my God. And um, all that information. So also when you're looking up information on people, that's totally open and free for anybody to see. So they will call and they'll go down a line of questions. And so that's when I was talking about how you have that questionnaire that you have access to. They'll just go through and they'll say, do you feel strongly, not so strongly, very strongly towards a different issue, a person, maybe something that happened recently? This is thought to be the most reliable form of doing polling. Although I'm curious now, because a lot of people are not apt to pick up their phone if they don't recognize the number. So I'm interested to see how that's impacted polling. The second, which I feel like would be a turnoff for people, is called interactive voice response or robo-polling. This is when you basically have a robot asking you the questions, the same thing, and you would answer the same way when you get put on hold and you can't speak to a person. And then online, people will fill out surveys online or on web pages and they can receive it. So they can either go in and actually fill out the page or they can actually be sent an email like SurveyMonkey and you can go through and start clicking things. Now, why is live or traditional polling more reliable? 
they have more control over who they can who they have answering so if they say we want to hear from florida voters they can go to the registration and look up florida voters and they can also make sure we asked 50 percent democrats 50 percent republicans or you know we made sure to get you know 30 30 30 for independence democrats and so on and so forth if somebody doesn't understand the question they can explain it to them or they can skip it and they can make that note where that's not really an option for you online or doing a robot. All right, so we're gonna take a look at some polls and we can use some of that information that I've been sharing with you and actually utilize it. So this, this one pollster that we talked about, Nate, Sil Nate Silver, he does 538. And a poll he just came out with recently is Republicans are less confident than Democrats that the election will be conducted fairly. So let's take a look at that. All right, so this is the website. Polls of the week. So obviously they're not asking just one question. It'll have multiple questions. And here you can, can you guys see my mouse when I'm doing this? Okay, cool. So I'm not like just pointing arbitrarily. So here, he's basing this off of NBC News, which did it through SurveyMonkey. So they did not do live polling, they did online polling. So you can see over time from August 9th to September 27th, how confident people felt about things. And what's cool about having these dates is you can look at what news events happen that may have affected how people feel about it. So there's a huge, sharp increase from Democrats around August 16th about the electoral process. Republicans stayed pretty even, but they went down. Something I thought was interesting is right here, September 6th, independents went down while Democrats and Republicans went up. And then right here, Republicans and Democrats went down while independents went up. So you can look at these things here and you can ask yourself what happened at this time that may have influenced how people feel about the electoral process. Maybe this is when that whole the US Post Office thing was happening and it was hitting the news and people were really afraid to mail their um, voter, their registration in there. I know for Florida, this is the time that we had our, um, what's it called? our primary so that may have affected Florida voters how they feel about it because they might have been right after they left the voting poll and said well that was fine I went in and I voted and it went fine so now I'm feeling very confident about how the election can go and then maybe Trump said something or tweeted something that maybe is making some Republicans not feel so confident about the poll while Biden perhaps said something that made them feel confident in it Something else he has here. Trump approval and disapproval, same thing. The generic ballot, it looks like it's staying pretty even. This is a much wider look though, from April 2019 to now. And you'll see that he says this is done by an elections analysis. And so 538 has their own polls as well as sharing polls from other organizations. I think I pulled up the wrong link for it, but so you can see here, like we'll pull up the NBC one. So here's another poll. Majority of people want Roe v. Wade to stand. 66% do not want it overturned. And they're saying compared to last year, 62% did not want it to be overturned. And then you have to analyze is 2% increase, is that a significant, is that statistically significant? I would say this is more significant. Independence went up from 65% last year to 71% last year. Here, read more about our polling methodology here. So this, and you'll find it somewhere that they'll have their methodology. And here you can get all the different information. This looks like a more generic one though. Like it's not from this particular poll. All right. 
The second one is from the Pew Research Center. So political divides, conspiracy theories, and divergent news sources heading into the 2020 election. Forty-three percent of the GOP say fraud is a major problem by voting by mail. Eleven percent of Democrats, on the other hand, feel that it's a problem. And so here they have all this information. It's a little bit small. Let me make my screen bigger. So they went really deep. So they said, among people who are Republicans or lean Republicans, they asked, do you think Fox News or talk radio is your major source of political news? And if so, is it a major problem? So people that don't listen to Fox News, only 23% of them thought it was a problem, whereas people who rely on Fox News felt, 61% felt it was a problem. And then they looked at Democrats. And then they asked them about MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, 4%. The highest they have is 18%. That's from the Hugh Research Center. All right, how we did this, here's at the top. It's kind of annoying they all don't have a standard, but okay, cool. So here, they tell you specifically, it was the American News Pathways Project. We can read more about that if we want to. We surveyed 9,220 U.S. adults from August 31st to September 7th. Everybody was a part of the American Trends panel, and it was an online survey. So in your thing at the very bottom, perhaps, of the story, you can say Pew Research Center conducted the poll with almost, you know, with over 9,000 U.S. adults over the course of a week with, through an online survey. And you can read more about their methodology even more methodology if you want to get really into it. And that's probably where you're going to find like margin of error and such. And then here they have the question that Trump campaign is a major political news source. So the actual campaign they find to be a news source. So the number jumps even higher. People who rely on the Trump campaign for their political news, 61% of them say that mail-in voting is a problem. People who rely on the Biden campaign 21% of them feel that it's a problem. And then there's about QAnon, whether QAnon is good or bad. Republicans, 26 of them say it's very bad, whereas Democrats say 77 of them say it's very bad. All right, and then we're gonna look at this third poll from Monmouth University, voters split on filling the Supreme Court seat. I like how they emphasize how you spell, how you pronounce it. That's great for TV people. All right, so on here, they go through all the different things they had, like all the different questions. So obviously, if they're gonna get you on the phone, they're gonna ask you more than one question, but the part I wanted was the Supreme Court vacancy. So this was interesting because they compared it to March 2017 when Justice Scalia died and everybody said, you need to wait for Trump to go into office to fill the spot. Now they're saying, well, if it's the election, Trump needs to fill the spot now that Ginsburg has died. So here it's saying right now, 47% should wait until, or they said 47% said they should allow the president at the end of his, his or her term to pick a new justice, whereas 49% say they should wait till after. It's almost like 50-50. What was interesting was they looked at a study, the same study they did from March 2016, where they said 57% said the Senate should vet the nominee versus 39% who said the process should be put on hold, the new president should have to pick. And then they broke it down by political leaning. 83% of Republicans said that Trump should pick the new justice nominee. Whereas four years ago, only 36% of people who leaned Republican felt that in that case, Obama should pick the new nominee. And then here we say right now, 16% of Democrats say that Trump should choose the nominee right now. Whereas 74% of them felt that Obama should pick the, uh, the nominee. So obviously both parties are very biased and want the Supreme Justice nominee to be according to what suits them. 
And then here you have different questions about the actual death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, about, about Trump filling the position, their ideological views about the potential justice, um, Judge Coney Barrett. And then they also had people um, asking questions about their first presidential debate. And then here you have some tables that they made. And here they have the questions. So the, the actual question they asked was, are you certain about your vote choice or might you change your mind before election day? And then here they even made a note to tell you that they, re, they switched the order of the questions where four came before three in case that made an impact. And you can see right here when they've asked that same question. And then here you can also see how many people they questioned. All the way to the bottom to have all the questions here. Methodology. So again, this was September 24th to 27th. So they did this in three days and they did a random sample of 809 registered voters and that's the the um survey was done in english so if you live in a state where you have like a high spanish speaking population then that's not really going to work for them um 300 and so they did a sort of like a hybrid 320 of them had a live interviewer call on a landline because some people have landlines 489 were done by a live interviewer and they called people on their cell phones then they also tell you that they were selected through random digit dialing. So they did not go through um, voter polls. They just literally randomly did phone calls. Here they have plus or minus 3.5 percentage points. And they have a 95% confidence rate for that. And then here you also break it down. So Monmouth has it really easily, you know, laid out here. So then, of course, if you have the store, you can say, according to a poll by Monmouth University, you can totally link out to it to have readers read, put it out on their own. All right, so that's all I have for you. I wasn't planning on taking the whole hour, and you guys have a life and have other things to do. And I know this week is a little crazy with, you know, trying to figure anything out. So I guess I want to take this time. Do you guys have any questions? about polling or some maybe if something wasn't clear you want to go over it a little bit or if you have any general questions about election sos while you have me here you can also email me if you want to talk in private does anybody have anything they want to talk about or have any questions or any comments of something that they've seen here i just want to say this coincides really well because i have a politics and government reporting class tonight and we have an assignment that's okay focused on polling analysis, so. So now you're like a total pro, awesome, right? Definitely, it dovetails <laughs> super nicely. Like, I'm just like sitting here and I'm like, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> like, yeah. well, I'm glad you're not sitting there like, I don't know, she doesn't know what she's talking about, oh my God. <laughs> That's awesome, I'm glad to hear that. When Was there the anything on here that you hadn't thought of before with, you know, reviewing polls that you're hoping that you can utilize or maybe there's some Thing that you were you know hadn't thought of before no i just perfectly did a bomb ass presentation i get it okay i cool. i have something <laughs> okay cool yeah hi my name is shioma and something that i definitely noticed that i've been called where they do the live polling and that's a lot right i'll probably stay on more than if it's like a robo call because it's a person like you said you don't want to be the person to hang up on them uh so i guess i can see why that is most reliable because that's the one that i would respond to the most although it is kind of annoying when someone's asking you do you strongly disagree slightly don't disagree like that's kind of annoying but i'm more likely to respond to that kind of person Absolutely. I know if I were to get a robocall, I would probably assume it's spam and just hang up and not even listen. Where if it's a person, I'm kind of like, oh, they're sitting there all day and they're probably like a poli sci student somewhere <laughs> being made to do this on a Sunday. <laughs> and I'm sure probably depending on where you live, you're going to be asked to be a part of polls more often than not, too. All right. I have a Is question there anything about else? Oh, oh. including the numbers, um, like surrounding the sure. poll, like the margin of error and how many people. Do you think that's a, a 
good practice to include when like discussing a poll is a little bit of the methodology? I think it is because I think that a lot of readers, especially if they're really interested in polling, they want to know all that information. It's something I would include at the end though and try and make it really quick, like not a huge paragraph about it, just even one, if you can fit everything into one sentence. You know, they, they polled 9,200 Americans over a three day period in September, you know, via online survey, margin of error was 3.5%. Just keep it simple like that. They don't. You know, and then that's another reason why I like to link out. So if they want to get even more detailed than that, then they have an easy way to access that resource and view it themselves. And Maya Sal, you had a question? Yeah, just um, just briefly real quick. Uh, in terms of like, uh, or in regards to like trajectory of polling, uh, I guess political polling in the future along like millions of years ago, I used to be a political pollster for a okay. local politics firm. Um, and, you know, they gave us like, um, you know, they, they gave us a apt analogy where it's like journalists can do the double barreled question. However, we can do that, but we can only get a, one answer from out of that. Um, but you mentioned briefly earlier about um, like the formats or like the approach to polling, uh, since a lot of people don't pick up their phones usually. Uh, do, do you, have you seen kind of like examples or just kind of like brief case like, like or kind of initiatives going on this election or just like um, just in general about politics about like using you know, like text or kind of like different formats because, you know, obviously, you know, you know, there's more larger sample sampling of people who would not pick up their phone now these days. And I'm just wondering like what kind of that looks like right now in the polling world. That's a really interesting question. And that's actually going to be something I would love to look into more so I can give you a better answer. But I know just from my personal experience, I have gotten way more text this election than I have ever before. Okay. So I think that they're definitely utilizing text, knowing that at least people will have that split section, split, split second to at least skim it and see if they're interested. And they get very personalized. They'll be like, hi, Christiana, the election's on the, you know, like, you know, especially with reaching out to people as like, you know, I want to know if you've registered to vote. Are you planning on doing your early voting? I've gotten calls and texts specifically because I signed up to get my uh, ballot in the mail and they'll specifically, you know, address that. So I think de definitely texting is probably going to be the way to go. And I know for definitely I hate saying younger generations because then I sound ancient, but younger generations, it's kind of, you know, there's like all those memes that are like, you know, don't call me, text me, don't leave a voicemail, text me. So I think that's definitely going to be a mode of communication, but I would be interested to see how they would do it. Like if they would be texting back and forth or if they would send you a link for you to go do an online survey. That's a great question. And I'm, that's inspired me to go look into that more. I'd love to hear about your your experience as a pollster too. <laughs> All right. If we don't have any other questions, um, we're going to let you guys go early. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, let me see what was be the best way. I guess I can share the in the chat. Hold on. Sorry, I should have just given you a bit.ly, but I don't feel like doing that right now. So if you want to, um, you know, look at those polls again by yourself or just get that list of pollsters and everything, go ahead and you can use that presentation and you can review that. And um, if you have any other questions, you can always email me. I have my Twitter and my email address here. Again, I'm not only here to talk to you about polling, I'm also the student slash fellow liaison. So if you're ever having any issues or you're having, you know, something that you want to bring up with your newsroom leader and you want to kind of talk it out a little bit before you talk to them or get a second opinion, you know, please feel free to talk to me. I'm here to help you out. And there's obviously the Slack channel. Your bosses are not going to have access to the Slack channel. We purposefully said this is only a place for fellows so you all can chat with each other. So if you're having an issue maybe that you want to, you know, even something simple like, 
I need to, you know, go out of town on Friday and I'm kind of, I'm not really sure how to ask about, you know, taking that time off because we already made a schedule. You guys can chat together. You can talk to me. So those are some great resources and yeah. So I hope everything goes well and the rest of training goes well. If you are doing the reporting track, I'm going to be doing the fake news game show on Friday. If you think that just sounds nerdy and fun, you're more than welcome to also just join me for that. That'll be a lot of fun. And you can always reach me and you know how to reach me. So I will talk to you guys later.